Welcome to Into the Words, a podcast from the Highlights Foundation Retreat Center. Today in the cabin is our dear friend, Tara Lazar. Welcome, Tara. (gasps) Thank you. This is so exciting. So we're so glad to have you here at our summer camp mentorship, our week-long summer workshop. Um, Tell us a little bit about what you're doing here. I know you were talking about picture books yesterday. I was talking about humor in picture books. And, you know, E.B. White said, dissecting humor is like dissecting a frog. They both die in the process. But um, I think for a lot of people, they find being funny or writing funny especially difficult So I was trying to break down what makes us laugh. And I took a look at some of the best-selling humor picture books of the last few years and kind of showed people where in the books or or how in the books they're funny. Like, Like something like incongruity makes us laugh. Two totally different things that don't necessarily go together. That's funny. Like uh, Tammy Sauer's book, Nugget and Fang. It is a shark who's best friends with a minnow. The shark's supposed to eat the minnow, you know, so how are they best friends? That is inherently funny. Mm -hmm. So I was just breaking down, you know, how to be funny, what makes people laugh. Um, And uh, then I tried to make people laugh as well. And how did you do that? (laughs) I don't know. Things just fly out of my mouth. I don't really have a good sensor. So I'm not really typically censoring my what, what I'm, my thought process is. So it just like, boom, shoots right out before I know it. And my husband always says that um, I'm very inappropriate at times. But it's okay. It highlights to be inappropriate. They think it's funny. And so talk a little bit about that inappropriateness at the picture book level. So (laughs) as you're writing your picture books, do you start being too far inappropriate and then bring it back to the right age level? Or does it just come out more age appropriate? I I think it comes out age appropriate. Um, Last night, we had a little art workshop with Shadra Strickland and we made accordion books and they had, there were like little dummy books that you could make spreads with. And she put down some paper and glue sticks. And we had all these art things to make a book with. And I saw this paper and it was kind of like an alligator pl- print, but it was pink. Hmm. And I looked at it and I said, that looks like a butt. And so I wrote a story called but B-U-T in parentheses, not but B-U-T-T. And it was <laughs> a very proper English gentleman trying to tell a story, but he used the word but, and the kid started snickering and going, mm, you said but. <laughs> um, and it was a misunderstanding, of course. Uh, so... And this was all just in the set art exercise. That art exercise, of but creativity. <laughs> you know, kids love scatological humor. Look at Captain Underpants and how popular it is. So, I thought a butt would be highly appropriate for the age level. And I bet it would be very well received. <laughs> Um, so let's shift gears a little bit. Mm-hmm. You were talking um, before when we were out in the other room talking about Story Storm. Mm-hmm. Tell me what that is. Story Storm used to be called Picture Book Idea Month. And I came up with the idea in November when we have National Novel Writing Month, which is more affectionately known as NaNoWriMo. Mm-hmm. So I came up with picture book idea month because we picture book authors didn't have anything. All the novel writers were on Twitter and social media and they're like, oh, I wrote, you know, 1,200 words today. Yay, I feel so accomplished. And everybody's congratulating them. And there was really this community built around NaNoWriMo. And I'm like, oh, I feel very left out. 
was always a little bit jealous. So I invented Picture Book Idea Month and more affectionately called it Peebo Igbo, like NaNoWriMo. And then people were like, well, how do you say that? Is it Pibo Idmo? Is it Piboldmo? Like they looked at all the letters and they couldn't pronounce it. I'm like, oh my goodness, if I would have just sat down and thought about the name for more than three seconds, I would have come up with something better. So a couple of years ago, this story storm has been going on since 2009. So it's 10 years. A couple of years ago, I decided, you know, November's a terrible month. People are traveling for Thanksgiving. They're getting ready for the holidays. Um, it's a very busy month. And the name is terrible, Paibo Idmo. So I named it Story Storm instead. I moved it to January. And all it is, is coming up with one idea for a picture book story a day for an entire month. I run it on my blog and I invite other authors and illustrators to blog daily about inspiration, where they get inspiration from, how how did one of their stories come into being. And this gives the participants motivation to come up with their own idea for the day. You write down the 30 ideas. At the end of the month, you have at least 30 ideas. You're a winner and you get to win prizes. And one of the prizes is feedback from a literary agent. Because I think when I was starting out, that was so valuable to get feedback from an agent on whether or not you had a viable idea for the marketplace. Um, So that's the prize that I give away. And people seem to love it. I don't know why, but they love it. (laughs) So how does one sign up for Story Storm? You just show up at the website and subscribe. That's it. You go to my blog, which is taralazar.com. And in January it begins. So in December, I put up a little blog post and I say, leave your name in a comment and you're signed up. There's no cost. There's no nothing. Anyone can sign up. You don't have to be a picture book writer. You can be a novelist and want to brainstorm ideas for characters or, or novel stories or short stories. Anything. Any writer can join. There's no restrictions. There's no cost. Just show up sign your name, and then read the daily blog posts. And if you like a daily blog post and you want to win a prize from the person that wrote that blog post, sign your name in a comment again. And I give away prizes. Uh, The prize distribution, I am very terrible at because I am not an organized person. So sometimes it takes me a few minutes, a few minutes, oh my God, a few months um, to get people the prizes, but eventually they do get the prizes. Get yeah. <laughs> but people don't do it for the prizes. They really do it to be inspired and motivated. Amongst a group of community. Yes, you because like I... with someone else. Right. Mindy Elise Weiss um, had the idea one year. She said, why don't, you, why don't you start a Facebook group specifically for StoryStorm participants so we could all chat? and have conversations. And that's exactly what I did. And I actually keep that group open year round. So um, again, anyone can join that and join that. You don't have to be a participant of StoryStorm. You just want to learn more about picture books. Come on in. Great. Yeah. So I'm gathering that you're a picture book author. I think I am. Tell me a little bit about your writing career. Oh, well, It's something I always wanted to do from the time I was old enough to write, I think. And even when I was a teenager, do you remember the uh, Children's Institute of Writing or something? And they used to send out little tests and see if you have the aptitude to be a children's writer. I did that as a teenager and they accepted me. And I was so exciting. I was so excited, but I didn't have the money to join the thing. So I'm like, okay, let that go for now. That can come later. Um, I went to college for writing. And when I got out of college, I wanted to 
get a job in children's publishing. I figured, okay, maybe I can become editorial assistant. I can become an editor. I can learn the business from the inside out. And then I could eventually write my own books. Um, it was really difficult to get a job when I graduated college. We were in a recession and um, a lot of people were struggling. I remember a lot of people moved back in with their parents and I'm like, I'm not doing that. I'm getting a job. So um, I did get a job in publishing, but it was in computer technical reference books for professionals. And it was extremely boring. Mm. I didn't stay long. Um, nine months, I think I stayed. And then I got a job in, again, high tech publishing. And I kind of went on that tangent. It wasn't until... Um, I had my children and I stayed at home that I said, okay, now is the right time. Because it was very important to me to be independent financially. And you can't necessarily do that with an artistic career right off the bat. You have to build up to it. And I had this stability once I had my kids um, that I had saved money for years and that my husband was working full time. And that I could devote to writing for kids. So when my second daughter was about a year old, I joined a writing group and kind of took it from there. I got an agent about two and a half years later with my book, The Monster. It's a store where you buy monsters, just in case you didn't know. (laughs) So that's, that's really how I got started. It was a lot of writing, um, a lot of writing new stories. I think a lot of early writers make the mistake of writing this one story and then being very invested in that story um, because it was their first or they thought it was such a good idea. And they pour a lot of work into that one story, revising it and trying to perfect it. And don't really move on. I think it's very important to write many different stories. Um, You learn more about writing a new story than you do from trying to fix an old story. That's just my philosophy. So I wrote a lot of stories before I got to the monster. A lot of bad stories. Um, A lot of very complicated stories before the format of a picture book really started to click in my brain. It just takes a while and it's something you can't teach. It's just practice that does it. Um, And speaking of practice, do you have a writing practice? Oh, my writing. Regularly. (laughs) I always tell people that, You can listen to what other authors do, other illustrators. You can listen to their practice and how they work, but that's how they work. And what you really have to do is find out how you work best. And that's a lot of trial and error and experimentation. And I have found that I write best when I do not write every day. But I do spend a lot of time just sitting quietly and thinking. Mm. Kathy Erskine was here and she was talking about how it's really important to have that quiet time and that letting your brain work on the subconscious level. That a lot of things click maybe when you're sleeping or, you know, you've read something right before you go to sleep and then in the morning you've figured out how to fix it. Or maybe you're washing the dishes, and as you're washing the dishes, you think of a good idea. Um, I write down my ideas as soon as I have them, but I let them marinate and soak into my subconscious. And there's some kind of gut feeling I get when I say to myself, okay, I think you're ready to give this a shot. And I try writing um, a story. And lately... The first draft comes out pretty good because I may have spent three or four months thinking about it. 
not necessarily writing it, but thinking about it. What is the character's motivation? Why are they doing this? Why are they the way, the way they are? I think about all that backstory first before you even start the story. And I, I seem to come to the table when I sit down to write having a better idea of what I intend to write so that the first shot, it comes out pretty good. Mm -hmm. So I wonder, um, how do you pick which story out of your head? Are there a hundred stories rambling around in these quiet moments or do you try to focus on a couple of stories at a time? Well, I usually try to focus on what I think is the most exciting idea I have at the time, what gets me most motivated. Um, and what's nice about having my agent is when I come up with an idea and I go, oh, oh my God, that's a great idea. Write that down. Um, I email her really quickly and I say, hey, I have this idea and I show her what the idea is and she either goes, eh, not really convinced, maybe you gotta do some more thinking on it, or she says, when can I see a draft? And that kind of helps, helps me gauge right. <laughs> whether or not I need to spend the time thinking some more or spend the time writing. And that's really, really helpful. That's so much of what I wanted when I got an agent was having somebody to bounce ideas off of who knows the marketplace and who knows selling, who knows the editors, who knows what may get picked up. So I don't waste all this time writing something like Gingerella, which nobody ever picked up because it was a cross between the gingerbread man and Cinderella. And it was very confusing. And it sounds like Barbarella, which you don't want to write about if you're writing children's books. And, um, yeah, I spent a lot of time on Gingerella, which never went anywhere. Nobody told me that Cinderella was the most commonly spoofed title uh -huh. or that trying to put together the gingerbread man and Cinderella doesn't really work. I don't know. I spent a lot of time on stuff that I shouldn't spend time on. All part of the process. It is. It's part of the process. I learned a lot, I will say, from writing Gingerella. Um, I still like the title. Uh, <laughs> I think it's a good mashup, but would I go back and write that today? Probably not. Probably pass. <laughs> well, Tara, thank you. Before we leave, I do want to just have a quick chat about getting to know your rhyming picture book. <gasps> yes! I believe you will be here in the fall here. of 2019 to yes. lead a group that will be here that, uh, that's a hybrid course. They're going to take six weeks online mm -hmm. and then they're going to come here for a four day retreat. Right. What can people expect when they're here? Well, they should know that I'm not a rhymer and they may be a little confused. Why is Tara Lazar here if she doesn't write rhyming picture books? I'm the story person. Gotcha. Okay. okay. So many people write rhyming picture books or, or attempt to write them and don't really necessarily have a story or a hook. Um, and I'm here to help them find what the story is that they want to write about or what this poem that they've made or these rhymes that they've made. Sometimes you get locked in to a certain story arc or a situation because the words rhyme. Right. Um, and I want to kind of break people out of that and let them see the bigger possibilities for their story. They may have to work harder to find that rhyming word, but is the story making logical sense? Um, is the story exciting? Is there a message underneath the story? Is there an emotional core these All these things that editors look for, are they also there besides stellar rhyming? Gotcha. So I'm the story fixer. Well, we look forward to having you back. I look forward to being back. I love it here.
Uh, speaking of that, will you give us a little plug for the Highlights Foundation? Talk to me about oh one of goodness. the things you enjoy about our retreat center. So uh, Heidi Stemple is a friend of mine. She's Jane Yulin's daughter. I'm not name dropping, am I? But um, Heidi said it best when she said there's some kind of magic here. Mm. There's some kind of magic that happens here that you get all the support that you need um, in the terms of great food, <laughs> three meals a day, you have a quiet cabin, um, you have nature to inspire you, you have great workshops, or you have an unworkshop, and you have plenty of time and quiet to write. I don't know if anybody else has kids. I do. Um, and they're 12 and 16. And I thought by the time they got to this age, they wouldn't need me as much. But there's always the, can you make me a grilled cheese sandwich at 2.30 in the afternoon? Or there's, you know, carpooling and all these things that interrupt my day and, you know, just blast a hole in my creativity and I can't do much. But I come here and I'm taken care of like I were the child, let's say, because somebody's cooking me meals. Thanks, mommy. And I have a comfy bed and I can do whatever I want and go where I want to go and talk to people and just have that quiet time to create. I don't know if you know this. You probably don't because I haven't told you, but I started writing a lyrical poem yesterday. Oh, wow. I don't write lyrical poems, but the atmosphere here just kind of triggered something in me. Some kind of magic kind of floats in the air and attaches itself to you somehow. Yeah. And you're able to get a lot done. It's just a wonderful place that I think if you if you write for children, it's some place you have to come. And I think, thank you for that. I think that that magic piece has to do with the focus on children's authors and illustrators and the idea of story for children and the amount of people coming through here talking about thinking about story. There's just residue all over campus because that's what we talk about all the time here. Yeah, you talk about it all the time. And then there's this lovely artwork that's all around you. Um, so there's a lot of inspiration and you just just stay here and you soak it all in, and it's great. Well, thank you, Tara Lazar, for joining us. Um, thank you, George Brown, for having me. Um, Into the Words, our Highlights Foundation podcast. That the Highlights Foundation, we are dedicated to continuing our 35 years of providing the space, the conversations, and the nurturing that goes into making great stories for children. Thank you for all you do to support the Highlights Foundation. But more importantly, thank you for what you do to support that belief that children are the world's most important people. I just, I need a tissue, George, because it's so beautiful. Tara, it's been a real pleasure. <laughs> we'll see you in the fall. See you then.